Coming up, I compare Space Panic clones. I chat to Jeff and end with the business update. A bit of a different episode then, so let's get on. Space Panic was released into the arcade by Universal in 1980, so this is a very early game. It predates Donkey Kong, and is considered to be the first, if not one of the first, platform games to appear in the arcades. The idea is simple, survive as long as you can with limited oxygen, and kill all the monsters. Each level seems to be random too. To kill them you have to dig a hole in the platform, wait for one of them to fall in, and then hit them on the head or fill in the hole, depending on which version you're playing. Later levels are harder, where monsters require double drops and multiple hits. Because it's a fairly simple game, I'll be looking for small touches in any clones to compare. For example, the man walking across the bottom of the screen before the game starts, an intro screen, the way in which the monster kills the man, which for some reason is odd, or all his clothes gets ripped off and the monster bites him in the bottom, and blood comes out of his mouth, and of course the way the monsters bounce when they're in the holes. A game that should have been easy to convert then to many home micros, and the Spectrum had a fair number of them. So, excluding type-ins, let's start. This is Bounce Panic, released by Poppysoft in 1984. The game differs slightly from the arcade. There is no man, just a bouncing ball. The game is similar, at least for the first level. You move around and dig holes. You can then drop through them. If a monster drops into one of the holes, you have to run back and bounce on them to kill them. The graphics are 8 pixel user definable graphics, and move in 8 pixel jumps, and although you can't break into the game, this feels and looks like a basic program. The sound consists of the standard beeps, and control is very sticky. The monsters do bounce when they're in the holes though, and the gameplay, once you get used to it, isn't too bad I suppose. The second level moves away from Space Panic and gives you some sort of bonus round with a collect em up thing, which is not very good. So a below average game to start with then. Next we have Burrier Beast, released by Kyrian in 1984. And this is a pretty good version. The man moves quite smoothly, although the chasing monsters move in character squares. Control is good, and the mechanics work well. The game even has two keys, one for digging a hole, and one for filling it in, just like the arcade. If you leave a monster in a hole too long, it gets back out, and is even more dangerous requiring a higher drop to kill, or multiple drops. Sound is used well, and I enjoyed playing this game. The time limit can be a bit short, and some of the monsters do follow set paths, which makes them easy to track and kill. It does play the death march when you die though, so surely there must be a point deducted for that. Apart from that though, a decent version. Next is Digger Dan, released by Ocean Software in 1983. I was looking forward to playing this game, but after a few attempts, I feel the game is not quite there. The graphics are nice and large, the sound is okay but nothing special, and control works, but you can often get stuck on ladders between floors and quickly lose a life. Digging and killing are two keys, and at no point did I see monsters that needed double drops, but then again I didn't manage to get very far into the game. One major flaw, or as the developers would call it, a feature, is that you can only dig two holes at once. So if you want to dig another one, you have to fill one in first. And that's a bit annoying. 
I also found myself chasing the monsters, who usually like to keep at the top of the screen. Their movement seems random, and they're harder to track that way. The levels are not random like the arcade, which is a bit of a letdown, and yes the game looks good, but I'm not convinced it's the best gameplay wise. Next is Monsters in Hell by Softech, released in 1983. Another game that drifts slightly from the arcade format. Here the levels are fixed, and the monsters spawn from the top left. You run around and dig holes for them to fall into, and there's no need to hit them on the head, so the game only has one action key. Some monsters die from a single drop, and others may need more. There's no time limit, Instead, you have holy power, and this decreases if a monster hits you. This can be replenished by collecting the crosses, and this is key to the game if you want to keep alive. The monsters just home in on your position, so you can easily lead them into holes, if you place them in a strategic place. However, you have to be careful when you dig, as you may block yourself from getting to a cross. The graphics are 8 pixel blocks and moving character squares as you can see, and the control can also be a bit sticky, meaning you can get stuck on ladders. Another average game that strays away from the arcade formula then. Talking of which, here's Mummy Mummy, released by MC Lothlorien in 1984. Now this is an odd game. You start in a pyramid, and have to dig a hole and then put a ladder into it. Using this method you lure the monsters to where you want to dig a hole and kill them. This is more of a chase and bait game though. Once you complete the level, or if you die, you automatically go on to the next level, which is a more familiar layout. I think the control is a bit off, and I often found myself, despite pressing the key for left and right above a ladder, not actually moving, so I couldn't use it. The timer is replaced by oxygen, and the game has additional gameplay elements. To complete the game you have to read 25 cartouches, those are those blue hieroglyphic things at the bottom of the screen. To collect them you have to move over them and press the R key. The game has several flaws. The monsters get stuck on top of ladders if you make a hole above them, meaning you then have to add another ladder to get on top of that. If you lose a life you go to the next level, meaning if you are not careful you can never collect enough cartouches to actually complete the game. You can also get stuck at the top of the ladder yourself if you dig a hole halfway down. Mm, very odd. You can also accidentally not dig enough due to sticky controls and get killed. And also, if you dig a hole just next to a ladder that slightly overlaps, the monsters don't drop down. Instead, they get stuck on a ladder, climb out and kill you. All of this makes for a very frustrating game in my opinion. I kept on playing though, despite constantly pressing the wrong key for left, which is I instead of O on a keyboard, but anyway, moving on. Next is Pandemonia, released by CRL in 1983. Oh dear, a CRL game. It can't be that bad, can it? Oh, oh yes it is. So you have to climb up and open this door. That releases... ah, oh, dead. So you climb up, release more monsters and... Dead, okay. So let's try and dig a hole to lure them in. You climb up the ladder. Ah, dead. Okay. Mm. One more time then. Up that. No. Dead again. Right, okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, oh dear. This is so annoying. Oh, I've killed something. And again, okay, I can move on and progress then. Okay, so let's climb up here. What's this door? Ah, oh, 
Why did it kill me? A typical CRL game, I think. Let's move on. Next is Panic, released by PSS in 1983. And here we have a familiar layout, but the action is just so slow. You start from the middle of the level as well for some reason, which is a bit confusing. The game uses 8 pixel graphics and things move in 8 pixel jumps. And the digging and running animation are a bit odd. The controls are sticky, meaning you can often get caught digging a hole and die. And the timer runs down very slowly, which is a good thing in one aspect I suppose. The monsters that require higher drops are there, but lining them up takes ages due to the overall speed of the game. The sound effects are poor too, almost like a basic game. The monsters do not bounce when they fall into the hole, and the whole thing is just a bit boring really. There's no urgency about it, usually provided by the timer and the frantic action due to the speed. One to keep away from then. Moving on, and now we have Panic from Microgen, released in 1983, also called Space Panic when you load it. Now this is a nice looking game, with a relatively smooth moving graphics, but that's because they move fast. They're still actually moving in 8 pixel jumps. The player is 16 pixels high, but everything else sticks to the 8 pixel format. Controls are a bit odd, and whichever joystick I chose it didn't work, so I had to use the keys. Once you get used to them though, it was fine. There are two keys for the actions, one for digging and one for filling in like the arcade, and the levels look random too. There are monsters that appear on later levels that require double drops, and the game has some nice sound effects. Sometimes the monsters came at you two and three at a time, meaning that you had no time to redig a hole after the first one had fallen in and you'd killed it. When they drop into a hole, they bounce nicely as well, and the game feels really nice to play. The time limit gives you enough time to clear the level, so you do get a choice of sitting and waiting for the monster to come after you, or going after the monsters. A nice version then, and one of the better ones so far. Next is Panic by Ian McCollier, released in 1984. Here we have a decent version of the game, with nice smooth graphics. The levels are random, and the sound effects are mainly okay, although nothing special. The control is a bit keen for me, I often found myself overrunning the holes I was trying to get to and colliding with the monster that had already dropped into it. There are monsters on later levels that need double drops and the gameplay is all here. It just feels, well, not quite right and I'm not sure why. All the main elements are present in the game, but something's bothering me. The time is more than enough to clear the level and there's a ticking sound that does add a little bit of urgency. The ladders vanish when monsters move past them as well, which does look strange. Sadly, I just didn't enjoy this version as much as some of the others, despite the nice smooth graphics. Moving on, next is Sam Spade, released by Silversoft in 1983. The first thing you notice are the graphics, large, smooth and well drawn. The next thing is the sound effects, really nice, and gives the game a professional feeling. The levels are drawn randomly too, and things just move along at the right pace. The timer for me was a little fast, especially when trying to get the later monsters to drop down two holes. Gameplay is great, and control is easy and very enjoyable. I like this game. It has nice little tunes that help things along, and for an early Silversoft 16k title, this is great. Definitely one of the better ones so far. Next is Sheer Panic, released by Vision in 1983. Now this is a modified or changed version of the Microgen game. Different top and bottom colours, different font and slightly different monsters. I'm not sure which one came first, but I'm guessing the Microgen version did. Same gameplay, same game. Let's move on. 
Next is Spectral Panic, released by Hewson in 1983, and this was one of Jeff's first games, so he's keen to tell me. It has an interesting main menu, allowing you to play the game, see a demonstration, reset the high score, and even return to basic, although this just resets the machine and doesn't actually show you any game code. Once into the game, we get 8 pixel user definable graphics that move in 8 pixel jumps. The layout seems random per game and per loss of life. There are also items to collect that extend the timer, rather useful. The monsters move around quite quickly, and using the method I had used for previous games tends not to work because of the short timer, so that means you have to take risks to try and get the extra time extenders. The keyboard layout is, for 1983, weird, but does match modern gaming. You've got W for up, X for down, A for left, D for right, while O and the K keys are used for digging and filling holes. When you die, you get a huge monster displayed in the remaining number of lives shown. This breaks up the game flow somewhat, and I'm not entirely sure it's a good idea. There are monsters that require multiple hits, and these change colour when you drop down. Also, when you drop down yourself, the hole fills in, which is not like of the other games. An early version, then, that shows its age. And finally, on to Super Digger by Abacus, released in 1984. Right, now this is slow. At the beginning, I did select speed 1, though. Anyway, let's carry on. You can also pick which maze you want to use. I presume that means layout rather than maze. Anyway, as you can see, everything is slow. The game follows the same path as the arcade, and you dig holes to trap the monsters. However, you can't fall down them because this kills you. That's a bit of a problem. But what you can do is jump over them. So this differs from the arcade, and I'm not sure it improves anything. Sound is okay, but the game judders along on the slowest setting. So let's try a faster speed, let's try medium. Okay, slightly better, but the bad gameplay is still there. I couldn't see a timer here either, just a bonus score, but if you let that run down, it kills you. Well that's it, unless you want to include Horace and the Spiders, but no, we're definitely not going there. So which was the best Spectrum clone? I think it comes down to two titles, Sam Spade from Silversoft or Panic from Microgen. And in the end, I went for Sam Spade. Large, nice graphics and great gameplay. Phew, finally finished. Let's move on. So today we're going to talk about Attic Attack while I play it, Paul. Excellent. It's a game that we've talked about before, and it's a game that I've never completed, and I know you can do it with your eyes shut. So, um, yes, lots of questions, lots of chat, really. So when you first got it, did you think it was amazing, or, or what were your thoughts? Because the previous ones... Oh, but wasn't it what's that... pick up? What's pick up? What do I use to pick up? I don't know. Oh, I not, don't not know. Not key. Oh, it's all frozen. Not that key. Not that key. Not that key. Oh. What do I use... What do we use to pick up an attic attack? Uh, this is going well. Oh, that key. Right, that's going to be really annoying. Have you found the key? Ah, oh, you've just died. <laughs> just <fine. laughs> I was just saying how good you can play the game, and there you go. Ah, the cross. I can play, I can play. So here, here's play the thing. The when, when I first played this game, I collected everything. Anything in the room? Yeah, so... You kind of want. Let's go and get the. Oh, oh! I'm gonna get. I'm gonna get three keys if I can. No, go away, mummy. Um, I'm gonna get three keys really, really quickly. That's good. I've I've, I've is, played the game. I've played the work. game for this like 15 work, minutes and only ever got one key. How the hell did you get three keys in a matter of 10 seconds? Because I know where to go. Oh, sometimes there's a bit of the uh, ACG key there. Uh, actually, sometimes there's a bit of an ACG key along here as well. I think this is going to have to be a Patreon video, by the way. Why? This is 
fact, I don't think this is going to work for the. Um, I don't think this is going to work for the show. Okay. It okay. might. So we'll carry on. So, as I said, the first time I played this game, I just collected everything. And it was very, very much later that I dis that I realised that you don't need to collect everything for points because some of the things refill your chicken or turkey or whatever it is, which is a very good way of showing your health, I think. I think it is. I agree with that. So, you know when I first saw this game, don't you? Yes. Your first Christmas, wasn't it? Christmas of 83? Yeah. Three? It's 83. I got this and Spectral Panic with my Spectrum. How did you discover the secret passages? And did you know that each of the characters had different secret passages? Um, I kind of did. When when I first played it, I always played as the Surf. Okay. And I the Surf can go through those barrels with 1884 on them. So I discovered the secret passages for the Surf first. Um, and then... Oh, God. Oh, the keys are the key, keys are going funny. Oh, that's something to do with where the keyboard scans, isn't it? Um, um, yeah, I discovered them. So I always played as a surf because I knew he had. Um, he could go through those secret passages. However, um, I the one thing I didn't do was read the instructions probably properly because I didn't realise you could pick up items for uh, for ages. Come on, old put Items like spanners and things and crosses. Yeah. Items like spanners, and, and in particular, items like keys. So I didn't realise you could pick up the keys to go through the door. So for the first few weeks I played it, um, I I didn't know about the keys. And then I went to see my cousin, and he showed me... Oh, there we go. Let's leave that one there, because that's a good one to leave there. Um, and then I went to see my cousin, and he he sh he basically showed showed me it being completed, and um, yeah, showed me that you could pick up the keys. Why why isn't that why isn't that firing? <laughs> uh -huh. there's, there's something to do with the emulator works and the way it picks up the keys that it means you can't. <laughs> it's just it's a pain. Um, yeah, he showed he showed me picking up the keys and what you could do, and then once I knew that, it, it wasn't it wasn't very long before I completed the game. No, on that side of that. Um, obviously, you need a map in your brain as to where you're going. Yeah, and obviously, actually, the fact that I've made a few wrong turns means that, that my map isn't quite as good as it used to be. <laughs> Right, now what I can do is I can... Ooh, I need to... I need to start picking up food. Um, but, yeah, and I love this game. So I got this and Spectral Panic for Christmas 83. And for the first six months of the... For the first six months I had my Spectrum, that was all I had. Let's go back and So, get basically, you just played this and Panic until you got another game, which was months. So you had no other choice, other than typing stuff in, of course. Yep, and I did type stuff in. I typed a lot of stuff in. Um, yeah, and I think Spectral Panic got the most play to begin with because it was easy. It was easy to understand, an easy game. I mean, my dad used to have like competitions of who could get the high score. And then I started playing this, and when I visited my cousins and found out that you could pick things up, it gave another depth to it, and then I played this loads, absolutely loads, and I would complete it. I actually think I used to be able to complete it. If if the keys were in the right place, I could complete it in about 1 minute 36 seconds, I think was my best ever. Wow, that's, that's going some. And even though you completed it, you still went on and carried on doing it again. Did you try it with different characters? No. I always played as the same character, almost certainly the Surf, from what I've said before. Actually. Um, <clears throat> always played as the same character, almost certainly the Surf, because I knew his secret passage. I can't remember when I found out the secret passages for the other characters. I'm presuming because you had it quite early, you the map wasn't from a magazine. You just plotted it in your head. So no, you knew no, it was. I've, 
Yeah, I just learnt it in my head. And when the maps got printed in magazines, were there any surprises? Um, and did it look? Did it look? Not, did it look like no. you expected it to be? Or, or, or like how you had it in your no, head? No, no, it didn't. When I saw the when I saw the map in Crash Magazine, it definitely did not look how I expected it to look. Any anything but. All right. Uh, it looks completely different to how it was in my head. It was amazing, actually. <laughs> there, was, there was definitely a certain map in my head, and the one in the magazine was so completely different um, that it, it was almost scary. <laughs> it was almost like, oh my god. You're playing a different game. <laughs> yeah. It's like, does that map really look like this? For example, the attic is basically square, and I never thought of the attic as square. So you have to go up to the top level to get one bit of the key, always. Oh, I hate this devilly thing. This devilly thing used to really annoy me. Um, really, really annoy me. Sometimes you get the blue key down here. The blue key's really useful on this level. Oh, no. Oh, well, no, I'll just take that. And then it's back to the start. Actually, you're going to you're gonna see me complete it, Paul. Marvellous. Something's going to have to go really wrong. Um... <laughs> Oh, there were these key scans, like... <laughs> really? See, it's too easy for really you. It's too, weird. It's, you know, you, you do it effortlessly oh. without thinking about it. Ah, da, da. Oh, you need some food. Nah, I don't. Uh, right, what do you want? You want that first? Oh, bollocks, hold on. Uh, oops. Didn't want to pause it. Uh, that one, that one. It's alright, I can still do it. I've still got loads of men left. Right, so you want that one, that one, and that one, and then you go through the door. There you go. 55%, That's so you finished it with only just over playing just over half of it. Is that rooms? Is that based on rooms visited or, or are objects used or collected? I think that's based on rooms visited. Right. So you don't have to visit every room to complete it? No. Nothing like every room. Um, I've played this a lot. The one thing I haven't done is never die and get 90... Day. You can't get 100%. For some reason, you can't get 100%. It's probably to do with the way the maths works for counting the rooms and things like that. Right. Um, but 99% is the highest you can get. I've never got 99% without losing at least one life. <laughs> okay. Is that because you run out of food or because you went into a It's because you run out of food. Right. It's because you, it's just because you run out of food. Because your your health ticks down gradually anyway as you play the game. Oh, right. I really enjoyed I really enjoyed that. I'm not sure how good a uh, let's talk about it makes though. With the stock control now in place and working, I can see that I need to buy things. To do this, I'll need to write to a few suppliers, get some quotes back, and see where the best place is to get the things I need. For this, I would obviously need some sort of word processor. Remembering here, we're in the 80s, of course, so no general access to the internet. I mean, I could call them, but this is a software test. The package would need to be microdrive compatible, so I can use it with the Plus D. It also needs to have a mail merge facility if possible, and obviously work with the printer. Now this part I thought would be the easiest, but it turned out to be a nightmare. The writer, my word processor of choice, is microdrive compatible, and even has an install routine. However, it fails on the Plus D. It works fine on an emulator though, but it sends some kind of pulse to the drive whilst installing, and that just doesn't get on with the Plus D at all. I then looked at Spectral Writer, and that also did not work, even with changes to the listing. I changed every line that had load, save, verify our catalogue statements, and even used the program's own save routines to save all the files to disk, and it still didn't work. I then looked at Word Manager, and this does install, but won't work with my printer interface. Well, this is getting to be troublesome, I then looked at Password 2, and this needs a few lines of BASIC to make it work with microdrives, as shown in the manual. What a mess. 
I ended up taking the version from the business cartridge that came with Interface 1, copying the contents to a tap file, loading them in, changing the code to use the plus D, and then saving the files out. Phew, at last I have a working word processor, but sadly without mail merge. First thing I need to do is create a letterhead that I can use in my letters, and this was fairly easy. I typed in the name address of the company, moved all the lines to the right, and there it is, done. I can now save this out for later use whenever I need it. Next I need to create a standard document to distributors, asking them for a quote, providing details of expected quantity of sales, and inquiring about credit options and credit limits. Once that's done, I can save it to disk, and I can use that letter as a template and just change the address to a different distributor. The word processor will come in handy for many more business functions, so I was glad to have got a working one at last. After posting a few pretend letters off, I received the replies and opted to go with the fictitious Hobbit Distributions Limited. Now I need to place an order. Back on the stock control system, I can do a reorder list and this shows me the games that I need to order. As you can see, there's a lot of them. Using this, I can place my order again using the word processor. Obviously, I need to keep a record of what I've ordered, so that when the order turns up, I can reconcile the contents and make sure that I've got everything that I need. Now, I could use the stock control program, but it had several omissions that would make that impossible. So next month, I'll be looking at different ways I can do this.